Modal modalities, maps and margins, optimizing oncological efficacy in 10 minutes. But fortunately, Caroline has said everything that I was going to say. So, um, so let's, let's try and uh, extract some kind of uh, new meaning from uh, what we're doing. So, so let's do... Um, uh, the, let's look at the energy sources that we've got, so the modalities that we've got, and try and think about them in a slightly different way. Because um, we, we now have a, a, a wonderful spectrum of energy sources um, on which we have to become experts at using. And we really have to understand them. We also have to understand their limitations. And we also have to understand the differences and the complementarities between them. Um, because if you're running a focal therapy program, you will probably need more than one energy source. And as you can see here, uh, historically, we've used extremes of temperature to coagulate the, the proteins irreversibly to kill the cells, uh, high voltage current to blow holes in the cell membrane, high dose radiotherapy, will, which will ablate if you get enough into, uh, into the prostate. Uh, light in its various forms has been used. Uh, direct toxic injection has had a bit of interest. We've tried it, failed. We, we, we had to abandon it um, at the end of phase one because we couldn't control uh, where, the, where the toxin went. Um, and, and, you know, these energy sources um, work differently. Um, you will work them differently. Some are externally applied, so high food from the outside world, either extracorporeal or in the rectum, um, external beam radiation therapy. A large number now that you can see in the room are interstitial, so it requires you to stick something into the prostate which will uh, liberate energy uh, in a certain way. Most of these energy sources disperse energy, and we have to understand when selecting patients the degree to which the energy is dispersed. High-intensity focused ultrasound, in contrast, concentrates energy onto a very fine point. So it's very, very different conceptually in terms of what you're doing to the prostate. And probably the big field of development, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, is these kind of mixed approaches. So um, uh, nanoparticles and then um, something to initiate them, whether it be light, magnets, sound waves even, to initiate a toxic payload that somehow has some degree of cancer selectivity. Um, we don't have a focal therapy that is cancer selective at present. We have to use our ingenuity and the, um, and the physics of the various systems to achieve spatial selectivity. Hence all the discussion and debate about MRI, lesions, what is it we're treating, and margins. So the selectivity and the benefit through low harm to the patient comes through us treating the bits we want to treat and not treating the bits that we don't. The ultimate focal therapy, as I, as I think I said yesterday, will, will eventually be at the molecular level uh, and, and you know, can, true cancer selectivity will be achieved, whether that's PSMA PET or something else in the future uh, will be determined. Sadly, uh, all our energy sources have to obey the laws of physics. Um, uh, and it's interesting that you know, every patient is different and every prostate is different and all our energy sources behave and propagate differently uh, in each patient and in each part of the prostate. Uh, and that requires huge skill, understanding, uh, in order to control those energies. It works very, very different in the an anteroseptal area than it does in the peripheral zone because the tissue is very, very different. Um, and and you know, the, the, all, all these issues happen and we adjust uh, to them uh, by overdosing, by overlapping, by repeating treatment in the various modalities that we have. We typically say that um, actually it doesn't matter what you use because um, the ultimate end result when you look at the prostate, either pathologically or down or through an MRI, is roughly the same. On the MRI, you see a, a black, non-perfused area which cicatrizes over time. Uh, but this was interesting. This was published last week, I think. Um, a Chinese group that um, looked at nine dogs with three different energy sources, laser, RF, and microwave, and looked at the cytokine levels that were stimulated by the various treatments, and also looked at the macrophage populations on the border of the lesions when the, prost when the, when the dogs were sacrificed and the prostates removed. Uh, the, the only thing to note from this paper um, is that different energy sources seem to do different things to the tissue which is in contrast to um, the kind of canon that we've been saying. It doesn't really matter how you cook the tissue because the end result is the same. This would suggest that, that it's not. Um, this shows the propagation uh, of the lesion over time at, one, at day one, one week, and one month. And you can see that the laser ablation is getting bigger over time where the other ones are cicatrizing and getting smaller over time and getting absorbed. 
And um, uh, so laser in green, RFA in red, and microwave in, in, in blue. And you can see the different amounts of uh, different subpopulations of macrophages around the end of the lesion. So it might matter, and it probably does matter, uh, how you kill the tissue, um, uh, how you kill the cancer, and actually the energy that you use will result in different effects uh, in the surrounding tissue. But I think this is fascinating, and uh, we need to do a lot more research uh, in this area. So who's eligible? Very simple. Uh, you've got a discrete lesion on imaging. The more discrete, the surer you are about that lesion, the greater the likelihood of success. Most lesions are clinically significant, if you believe clinically significance is the presence of pattern four. Uh, we need to apply margin to all cancers, as has been said, and obviously it helps if the patient wants to preserve genital urinary function, I yet to meet a patient that doesn't, and obviously proper consenting for the patient. But this is the interesting thing, and the thing that was emerging today during the discussions is focal therapy as a component of modern lesion management. And we, we don't have to treat straight away. We don't have to biopsy straight away when we, when we see an abnormality in the prostate. And when we meet a cancer for the first time, we, we don't really know how long it's been there. Seven weeks, seven months, or seven years. And this is 2018, he was biopsied. Five millimeters of three plus four, good correlation, pattern four equals 10%. So five millimeter being the maximum cancer core length. Um, in 2021, a few years later, uh, you can see that lesion has remained unchanged. He, he elected not to have treatment, and we said we would watch it. The gap between the MRIs is probably a little bit more than I would have liked. Um, uh, and, but you can see the lesion is, is, is completely unchanged, and the ADC value the same as it was uh, three years earlier. And then seeing him very, very recently, um, this year, PSA unchanged, ADC value very, very similar, and the lesion is still there. So one could have treated him at the beginning, one could treat him now, one could treat him um, on evidence of lesion progression, in other words, an increase in size, or an increase in intensity of the signal, uh, or an increase in PSA, PSA, or some other biomarker that you want. So I think the, the, the role of focal therapy in lesion management is probably the new way to think about this technology and this approach that we've all been uh, discussing today. And you know, when you see a lesion, as we heard today in one of the questions, um, most of the information, most of, most of the really important information is, is within the 100 million cells that this lesion represents. And most of the key genetic mutations that um, carry risk, not all mutations do carry risk, uh, but you need to have a mutation for risk to be present, um, uh, are present within the lesion. Lesions are very, very different from normal, inverted commas, prostate. No, no prostate is normal. There are mutations in any part of the prostate that you sample, but they are concentrated in the lesion, uh, probably because of the number of cells that we see there. Um, and if you look at many, many publications now comparing visible versus non-visible, it's really interesting to see that language starting to emerge in discussions today, qualifying the disease by conspicuity, visibility versus non-visibility, because they're very, very different. And if you can see, if you're sitting on that side of the room, you're lucky, you can see that um, the, uh, the visible ones tend to be a higher grade, they're usually bigger, they have a lot more cells, and the invisible ones inevitably at least in 3 plus 3. Many, many studies now showing the difference uh, between visible lesions and lesions that uh, are not seen. And, you know, when I see, when I mention lesions, I'm, I'm, I'm not an MRIist. Um, I believe in, in the, the clinical manifestation or the phenotype that's being generated um, by the gene expression in that prostate. And that can be by MRI, it can be by PSMA PET, it can be by choline, and it can be by ultrasound, if you like. Um, because, as we've heard today, the overlap isn't perfect. Um, this is an MRI PSA positive lesion. Uh, this is a PSMA MRI negative, PSMA positive MRI negative lesion. Uh, this is a PSMA negative MRI positive lesion. And this is a PSMA negative MRI negative lesion. What you will have noticed is a wonderful kind of taxonomy of phenotypic expression, which may have prognostic value. We don't know yet. Uh, but what is interesting is that the bigger the lesion, the greater the likelihood of both being positive. And uh, we see things, whether it be by ultrasound, whether you feel it on the end of your finger, because they're bigger and they're a higher grade. Uh, that, that's what makes things 
uh, clinically manifest. So it's not, it shouldn't be any surprise that uh, when you can see something, uh, there are going to be more cells present. That means more mutations um, and more genetic instability. So um, when choosing a case, um, uh, if you're starting out, choose a lesion that you can see from across the room. I hope you can see this one from across the room. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I can see it very clearly here, and you can see it there. Um, and this is the coronal. Um, you can, if I can light it up, there it is. And you know exactly on the Z plane where it is. Uh, this is a lovely case to, to, you know, the rest of the prostate returning completely normal signal on the ADC. You can probably even see the long B sequence, B2000, on this, on this three Tesla scan. This is a, one hesitates to call cancer a thing of beauty, but in terms of its phenotypic expression, it is, it is giving, in every single sequence, it's giving a very, very strong, very strong expression. And, and if you choose cases like that, where you're absolutely sure where the cancer is and where it isn't, and then you plan your treatment around it. So this is using HIFU to place an anterior margin around the, um, the drawn margin of the, of the lesion, uh, which you can see there. Uh, a very good anterior medial margin, maybe, maybe not as much uh, lateral anterior margin as I would have liked. With just, just treating the capsule, it might have, might have been good to add another click there to get um, the levator next door. Uh, this is now you're treating on the tumor, and we are creating a good medial margin uh, of at least 10 millimeters and a lateral margin of around 6 to 9 millimeters, uh, which re refers to two to three clicks that you can see there. And I haven't got another slide to show you the, the posterior margin. So identifying the case very carefully, planning the treatment very well, and making sure you can get margins around it that don't impact on key anatomical structures which would impact on the individual's function. And there you can see a sagittal, very lateral uh, hit, and again, maybe slightly short on the apical margin, uh, which is here. Maybe if I'd had my time again, I would have put another click just there. And we've, I think we've seen this slide many times before, uh, that foc focal therapy means a lot of things, um, and we can use our energy sources to do many, many different types of focal therapy. In the early days, we treated anatomically. Um, so this wasn't built around the tumor, it was built around the prostate. We then started, once we could see the tumor, built the treatment around the tumor. And then more recently, people are having different thresholds above which they treat and below which they are happy to observe. Exactly the same as we do in surveillance, but in this case it's done at the prostate level, not at the patient level. And so let's just run through some cases, one of the very early hemiablation cases. Uh, so this patient was treated in 20, or well, published was included in the series from 2010. Um, you can, going back, can I go back? Yeah, I mean, you can see that actually in retrospect, this is quite a big tumor. Uh, it was permitted within the protocol and uh, probably fortunate that in the small prostate he had a hemiablation. This is six months out, so we're seeing the healing. The, the 20 cc volume now has gone down to about four or five, and you can see a little bit of involution of the rectum and scar tissue there. You can see how difficult these things are to biopsy. This is hard scar tissue that needles don't like to go in and don't like to de deploy through. Very, very hard to get reliable tissue capture within hard, um, fully mature scar tissue. And now, in order to generate the margins, we've talked about margins a lot today, uh, you, in many systems you can pre-specify how much margin you want. In red, this chap has three cancers. There are two in red in the left anterior horn and one in yellow uh, here in the uh, posterior, left posterior aspect. Uh, we're treating them in kind of all together, uh, but applying margins around the two red ones that you can see here and another one around the yellow one that you can see there. So he'll end up with a essentially a lateral ablation that won't go anywhere near his urethra uh, and will provide him with a very, very generous margin. And if you'd like to look at things from a sagittal perspective, you can uh, on this slide here. So let's rattle through this largely to look at the kind of efficacy stuff. The, um, my operation note doesn't matter, uh, but the post-treatment scan does. So he had a, a small, relatively small anterior horn lesion. Uh, this is the early post-treatment scan. Uh, so this was done day three post-op. Uh, and we can see this, this very dark non-perfused area, which is what we want to see. We want to see the rectum preserved. Uh, we want to see key structures still having some degree of blood supply. Um, I, nobody knows whether the um, neurovascular bundle will be preserved on the treated side, but we can certainly say that they are preserved on the other side. Um, and, and we want to make sure that there's a good margin around the original. Uh, there's a lot of edema at day three, so it needs quite a bit of 
uh, skilled interpretation from the radiologist. This is useful, so this shows you that I'm willing uh, to go outside the prostate, and this was a, um, I skipped through it, but this was a uh, left anterior horn lesion that was close to the capsule. Uh, I've extended the margin to go into levator, which you can do without causing any harm. And we go into levator uh, when we do surgery, but you can see the levator there uh, with, necros with necrosis, which gives me a, a nice additional lateral margin. And we've gone all the way to the base of the prostate, but importantly, the sphincter um, is completely preserved, as you can see here. So the uh, posterior MRI uh, kind of giving us the reinsurances that our margins have been sufficient. And this is the late scan that forms the new baseline um, going forward uh, against which all future scans will be compared. And this is probably only possible about nine or 12 months after, after treatment. It requires that long for the scar tissue to mature and settle and remain stable. So let's go through that. So, um, so and I, I'm just finishing now um, on, because we're kind of on oncological efficacy, efficacy the back end of the, of the title, and just, just how far we can push the limits with focal therapy. And we had this discussion a bit today, um, and modern risk stratification, as we've all discussed, is very different from old-fashioned risk stratification. Uh, and MRI and PSMA, PET and choline, or whatever you use, does put a ceiling on the risk that hitherto has been very difficult to do. Uh, this is a large lesion, um, but, but situated in a kind of anterior uh, position of the prostate. Radiologically, T3A, but clinically, T1C. Nobody's going to feel this cancer. So, um, so we're, you know, by loosely using T3A, we're upgrading this individual compared to the attribution that he would have had originally based on the systems, uh, on the risk stratification systems that we're using today. Um, and if the cancer is located well, um, it's, it's certainly possible to treat safely with a margin with very, very low toxicity. Um, and I'm very happy to treat the older man who's been very well stratified with high risk disease uh, because you can get a very good margin uh, around that. Um, they're, they're out, they're home the same day, uh, they're chopping wood the next day, and they save themselves, you know, months of radiation, sorry, months of hormones and um, possibly weeks of radiation therapy. And actually you don't burn any bridges because that, that option is still available to them. So I think uh, in time, uh, we, we will probably be extending our indications a little bit once we're a lot more confident uh, about uh, volume location and indeed underlying grade. So, in summary, um, we, need a, we need a range of treatment modalities. This is one of the largest growth areas in neurology. It's amazing to see so many companies innovating so fantastically well. Case selection is the most important thing. Um, uh, and having a cancer that's clearly identifiable uh, is the way to go. You often regret treating a diffuse cancer. You don't know exactly where it was. Um, there may be biological differences between energy types. We don't really fully understand that yet. And existing risk stratification systems almost certainly overestimate the patient risk. Thank you very much.